Two people stand in front of a vast coastal scene that takes up three walls of a grand room. Title, Slow Whistler Arav. Slow TV of Rex Whistler's mural as Plas Newydd, like you've never seen before. The pair stand at one end of the painting, gazing down at a trompe les oil colonnade. It creates the illusion that the painted space is three-dimensional and big enough for them to walk along. At its far end stands a gardener with a Benson broom. Our view rises from his stout brown boots and garters, up his green tweed breeches, to his tweed waistcoat hanging open over a soft white cotton shirt, a bright red neckerchief tied round his throat. He is in his twenties with short brown hair parted on one side and a kindly expression in his deepest eyes, a self-portrait of the artist. The camera tracks slowly to the right, through the arches of the creeper-clad colonnade, towards the painted town beyond. A classical-looking three-story townhouse is painted dusky pink, with a stone crest over the door. Beyond it, a church spire recalls St Martin's in the fields, as the buildings from the fantasy town climb the hillside. Beside the pink building, a triumphal arch is flanked by columns topped with mythical beasts. Sunlight hits the densely packed buildings from the right, creating deep shadows on the left-hand side. People stream through the triumphal arch as though it is the main entrance to the city, including a blue jacket rider on a glossy chestnut horse. A beggar holds out his cap, but is ignored. The camera tracks down to the waterfront, where cloth bales and rows of wooden barrel wait for a ship. Massive timbers reinforce the land where it meets the sea. Sun glints on a channel disgorging water over its end into the waves below. The sea is an emerald green flecked with white spindrifts as the water laps the base of a wooden harbour wall. A twin mass schooner lies close by. A flight of steps leads from the choppy water by the ship's bow to the top of a wall, beyond which is a dock where the turquoise water is calm. More boats float here, with no crew in sight. Large boats along small dinghies and skiffs. Wearing clothes from a variety of historical eras, people watch the boats from the dockside, and a cart waits in readiness. Two women stand looking at a bronze statue of a horse and rider. An inscription on its plinth identifies the figure as the Sixth Marquis of Anglesey. The camera pulls back, revealing a large circular baroque building with a dome. Magnificent mountains ascend behind the city. Forests hugging the lower slopes give way to craggy peaks and a lowering sky. The atmospheric mountains contrast with the precise geometry of the building, every detail perfectly picked out. Topping one peak, as though carved into its blue stone, is a walled medieval city. A little closer, a town clings to the forest hilltop, with a path winding up to it.
As our journey continues, a red round tower comes into view. Castellated, it has a similar tower on top, and on top of that, an iron brazier for signalling. The whole edifice stands on a barbican, a defensive wall projecting into the sea. Looking back towards the city, the soft muted stone colour of the buildings are seen through a crisscross of masts, rigging and furled sails. A man rows a woman and child in a small dinghy across the water at the foot of the Barbican towards a three-mast schooner anchored in the harbour. The woman is swathed in a red cloak, the child wearing yellow points towards the schooner. The oarsman in blue has only one oar. A giant urn sits on a plinth terminating a wall that separates us from the sea. To the right of this wall is a central flagstone jetty. A trident encrusted with seaweed is propped up against the urn, which resembles a Greek jug with a handle and a spout. Classical figures are moulded into its body. The spiky gold crown of the sea god Poseidon sits at his base on a feathery piece of a red kelp. From the central jetty, our viewpoint follows a line of dark, craggy mountains leading out to sea. The distant headland takes on a rosy tint under the dusky clouds. In the centre of the bay sits a fortified island with its own buildings, including a church with a tower topped by an onion-shaped dome. The flag of St George flies from a red brick turret, and ivy teems over its crumbling walls. The bridge spans from the fortified base of the turret to an outcrop of rock which supports two smaller towers. Gazing out from our position on dry land, across the stone jetty to the fortified island in the centre of the bay, Seagulls arc overhead, suspended high in the sky or dancing above the waves.
People alight from a dinghy drawn up by stone steps that lead from the water to the left of the island. A large statue of a woman in classical drapery, perhaps the Madonna, stands on a paved area in front of the church that rises from a hugger-mugger of buildings. Clothes hang from washing lines tethered to one of the windows and stretch above the heads of three men on the waterfront. Its far end is tied to the mast of the boat, drawn up on the quay. Our view cuts to one that takes in the whole island with its offshoot, the fortified walls and sandy colour contrasting with the turquoise sea. As the camera pulls back, one girl hangs suspended above the choppy wavelets. Stone bollards line in the far edge of the central jetty in the foreground, linked one to another by a length of rusty chain. A red life boy bobs in the water, the choppy waters echoing the mountains with crests and valleys and shade of greenish grey. A neat coil of rope lies on the jetty between a stone bollard and a metal cleat. The rope is perfectly painted, rough looking, but very clean. Its final loop uncurling onto the flagstones of the jetty, close to a set of steps which lead up from the choppy water. Wet footprints mark the pale stone, as if Poseidon had climbed out of the sea. Five perfect toe prints spread from the pad of the right foot, and a star-shaped splash before that of the left, which is less distinct. The spiky leaves of the plant sprout from cracks between the pavings. Each plant is different, some like grass, others daisy-like with broader leaves. Lying across the jetty is a wooden oar and a boat hook, its long handle painted bright red. The oar, perhaps, left by the sailor in the boat with the woman and child. A rope knotted around a second cleat drops down over the wall, its far end tied to a fishing catch. Standing at the bow, a fisherman in green shirt and beige patched trousers tips a basket of small fish into the water, their silvery bodies catching the light as they tumble into the waves. A second basket sits in the boat behind the fisherman, and predatory gulls swoop down nearby, attracted by the bounty.
The sails of the ketch in various shades of brown, from strong tea to weak, hang slack, their yarn ties hanging straight down in the absence of any wind. A close-up shows the fisherman with a clay pipe clamped in his mouth, the small fry from his basket tumbling over the side of the boat and into the water. The camera directs our view up the mast with their web of rigging to a gathering of gulls swirling high above the deck. Beyond the boat to the right, a feathery tree grows alongside a conical tower. More greenery grows from the broken top of the tower and the wooden scaffolding erected for repairs echoes the masts. A French tricolour flutters from one of the masts of the fishing catch, a pennant from another. High above, clouds billow and roll like smoke, in shades of grey tinged with pink. The clouds darken into the distance. sky seems to go on forever, its colour recalling the watery depths below. Land looms in the form of a blue-tinted headland, its edges chiselled with time. In the calmer waters of the harbour, two men punt a pleasure craft like a large gondola with curved ends and a little cabin. A green and white stripped awning attached to the cabin shades the women sitting beneath. A fluted bowl of fruit sits on the harbour wall in the foreground, next to a raffia-wrapped wine bottle. A close-up of fruit, textured melon, glossy black grapes, oranges and a pear. Red seeds spill from a split pomegranate, succulent and gleaming. We move slowly along the low harbour wall. Two gulls are standing on its smooth stone top and a third is coming into land beside them. Beyond the gondola, a man paddles a kayak. The shadows of leaves dapple the sunlight on stone wall as a tree branch comes into view.
A close-up of the seagulls with their dark grey heads, red beaks and red legs. One has its head turned back, its beak ruffling its wing feathers. The second looks out to sea. A wide shot frames all three birds with the tip of the gondola jutting in from the left. Beyond a stretch of water, three rowboats are tied up side by side, their bows nudged against the foot of a small stone landing stage. From the landing stage, stone steps lead up through the ornate arch. To its right, more small boats are pulled up onto a curved sandy beach, lapped by the water. A figure pulls a small cart along a broad sandy path, which leads up a beach between the timber buildings. Viewed from the water, the Ornit Arch is topped by a large oriel window. To its left is the courtyard of a grand Italianate house, which overlooks the water. A double staircase zigzags up the portico at entrance to the first floor. Halfway up stands a servant, perhaps sweeping the stairs. Another servant is doubled over under the weight of a sack, which he lugs across the courtyard. These are just two of the many figures that populate the painting meaning there's always someone or something new to spot. More figures walk up the beach path from the waterfront towards a tall arch, through which a steep street climbs into the town. A church with a pale pink tower topped by an onion dome rises up above the tiled roofs of the clustered buildings while a silver waterfall cascades down the hillside beyond. The mountains make a majestic romantic backdrop in shades of misty green, tinged pink perhaps by the setting sun. A close-up of a church tower with its pink walls and white stonework, which, like icing, outlines Palladian-style windows and doors. Sun glints on a metallic onion dome of its roof topped by a final and small cross. The camera pulls back to show the church and clustered buildings from the seagull's viewpoint on the central jetty. To the right, the view is fringed by leaves of a nearby tree. The buildings in pastel shades are a bright spot between the turquoise sea that laps the shore and the greeny blue of the cliffs behind. Our view of the tree expands as the camera tracks to the right. Its branches slender, foliage feathery. Slowly, it fills the frame, blotting out our view of the buildings and the blue remembered hills beyond. In the top right corner, the grey-green trunk hoves into view. Lit from behind, its leaves are individual and distinct, like a painting by Rousseau. The tree trunk reaches higher, 
dividing into lofty boughs that stretched towards the light, covered by lush foliage. A close-up of the leaves. An oval swirl of dark green, licked by lines of sage, so that they're almost variegated. If there are any birds, they're hidden in the dense overlapping leaves. Another change of angle shows the right side of a tree. Its leaves coppery brown where they're flushed by the sunset. The light throws some ivy trailing on a wall in deep silhouette. The ivy shrouds the end of another arcade, with views across a beach edged by willows. Boats are drawn up onto the sand. As the camera continues its slow track to the right, the inside of the arcade is shown in a deep shadow. A splash of red clamours for our attention. The cover of a book, leaning against a pillar that forms one of the open archways. Another arch holds a carafe of red wine, Leaning against the third arch is a cello, its bow and some sheets of manuscript scattered on the black and white diamond pattern floor. In a corner made by an internal pillar is the stone bowl of a drinking fountain in the shape of a clamshell. Water streams from the mouth of a fish-shaped gargoyle above. Peering round the pillar is a little black and white dog, its ears pricked, head on one side, perhaps wondering where the cellist has gone. The dog stands where the tiles give way to a shallow trompe oil staircase, leading to the far end of the arcade. A red cloth, the same shade as the book, is draped over the balustrade by the stairs. The camera pulls back to reveal two more dogs at the entrance to the arcade. One is small and black with a pearl collar, it nestles on a pink velvet cushion with a plate of food beside it. The second, perhaps a pug, has a beige fur and a curled up tail. It has to stand with its hind legs on a book to reach the arcade floor. From this angle, we realise it's the dog, not the absent cellist that's attracted the first dog's attention. On the edge of the step, just inches from the front paws of the pug, lies a cigarette, smoke trailing from its glowing tip. <coughs> On the next step down, lies an abandoned pair of glasses with turtle shell frames, suggesting, perhaps, that the artist might be back. Looking down at the cigarette and the glasses, the couple finish their inspection of the mural and leave the room. If you'd like to know more about Rex Whistler or the mural, head over to www.nationaltrust.org.uk forward slash plas dash newith. Audio description by Louise Fryer and Andrew Holland and read by Ailir Gwynn for Vocalize.